I think we've had a bird blow up up here. I'm not sure what we have. This is an interesting story this morning, right? It says the good news of Jesus. Repent or you'll perish. It's the good news of Jesus, right? What does this story tell us? And this is going to be hard this morning for several people I've seen walk in, knowing things and hearing things. Because what does this gospel lesson tell us? Tells us a lot of things. There's two things very clearly that it tells us. But before we get to that, why did these Galileans die? We don't see this anywhere else in any scripture. That's the other thing that you need to know. These stories this morning, these two parables or, or stories that we have out of the Gospel of Luke appear in no other gospel. They're only in Luke. There's several stories like this that are only in Luke. But Luke tells us about these Galileans whose blood was spilled with their sacrifices. And Galileans, we have to understand, are Jews. Right? They're not anybody else. They're not another, another denomination. They're not another nationality. They're Jews that live in Galilee. Right? Galilee is part of the Jewish nation. Nation. But to Jews that lived in Jerusalem, Galileans would be further removed from the center of where they're supposed to be, right? It's like, this is going to sound bad. That's why I pause for a moment as I'm thinking about saying this. It's like those who come to church once a month opposed to those who come to church three times a month, right? They're further removed from the worship center. Not that they're any worse than those who come more often. Right? Because we're all in the same boat. So, it's just that the Jews in Jerusalem saw the Galileans as someplace separate. So, they, these people come to Jesus and say, these Galileans were killed by Pilate. Were they worse sinners than the other people out there? No. What about those at the Tower of Siloam? See, Jesus has an example brought to him, and then Jesus turns around and gives another example. What about those that the Tower of Siloam fell on? That were they worse sinners than anyone else around them? Do, do people suffer because they're sinners? Do they? Do people suffer because they sin? The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering, the answer to that question is yes. Do people have bad things happen to them because they're sinners? Possibly. The tricky part to this lesson is not that sin is not separated from suffering. Because sin and suffering are connected. When Jesus talks about these Galileans that are killed, there's suffering involved there. But it's not on the part of the sins of the Galileans that they got killed. Right? Right? We don't suffer because we're sinners, because we're all sinners and we all deserve to suffer. Remember last week's sermon? If we get what we deserve, none of us get what we deserve, right? Because of Jesus. So does sin cause bad things to happen? Yes and no. Why do good things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Here's a little hint. I'm not going to give you an answer to that question. Because I can't. Because bad things happen to everybody. And that's not fair. Thank you. Who said that? My little man in the front row. <laughs> Life's not fair. For those of you who have received your newsletter and have read it, you actually got a glimpse of fair. What is fair? As my wife and I prepare for Christmas presents for our three girls, we try to make things fair, right? Which means they all get the same number of gifts. No, in our house, that means they all get the same number of gifts. <laughs> is that fair? No, that is equal on one level. So what if we said each kid gets $100? Is that fair? No, that's also equal. 
That was a trick question, by the way, in case you didn't catch that. Right? It's not fair that they all get the same number of gifts because I could spend $300 on one. Not that I do, children. <laughs> I could spend $300 on one, $50 on another, and you know, $25 on the third. Right? They all get the same number of gifts, so that's fair. Or if I spend $100 on each of them, one of them might get one gift. One of them might get three gifts. One of them might get... However, man, a hundred gifts, that's right. I might buy a bubble gum too, so that would be even cheaper. So it, they might get... But is that then fair? Again, that's equal. So what's fair? Because we all want what's fair, right? And what is fair? That we get what we deserve. Is that... I see a couple of people unwillingly wanting to go like this. <laughs> Right? Because we already talked about that last week. For those of you who weren't here last week, you need to go and listen to that sermon. It's online. Um, getting what we deserve would be fair. And that's what everybody deserves. Right? That's not equal. If you saw the newsletter article, the, the newsletter article breaks down very clearly, along with my, my description of my children's presence. What is equal? With the three boys and the three boxes. And the three boys are all different sizes, right? And they all stand on their box. And the third boy can't see the baseball game that they're trying to look at. But when the boy on the end, who's taller than all the rest, gives up his box and gives it to the short boy on the end, then all three of them can see the game. That's not equal, but that's fair. All of them are able to see the game. They all get what they deserve to see the game. And being fair means sometimes that we give up what we think we deserve. Because this text is not about what is fair. It's not about us suffering because of sin. Right? Because we all suffer because of sin. It's about repentance. And just what is repentance? I discovered something this morning. As I was looking through the text, the word for repentance in the Greek is metanoia. I know you all were dying to know that, so I'm just... Luke uses this word and its derivatives more than any other gospel writer. I did a quick word search this morning on the two basic forms of metanoia in the Greek New Testament. And... Luke uses it almost three times more than one of the other Gospels and a third more than one of the other. The Gospel of John doesn't even mention the word repent. Which is very interesting because the Gospel of John is the one that links us to sin and suffering, right? Because John in chapter 9 has the story of Jesus healing the blind man and the blind man going before the Pharisees and talking about it. And the disciples even asked Jesus at the beginning of that chapter, who sinned, this man or his parents, so that this man was born blind? Right? Somebody had to do something in order that this person was born with an abnormality. Something had to happen wrong to make this happen. And that's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. But it's about repentance. So what is repentance? What does it mean to be a Christian? Does being a Christian mean that you live a perfect life and you never do anything wrong? No, good. <laughs> Does being a Christian mean that you follow some kind of moral code and work your butt off to never break that code? <clears throat> I, oh, we're not, so pre we're not so ready to answer that question now, are we? So we'll give it that we're not perfect people, but is being a Christian following a moral code? It should be I get and I get yeses. What if I told you it's not? And it's okay to disagree with me. That's fine. Being a Christian is living a repentant life. And what does it mean to be repentant? Repentance in the Greek and in the Hebrew both are physical actions. And that's where we, I think we get into trouble sometimes. They physically are actions of turning around, of reorienting our lives. 
And the, and the thing that this that Jesus says here each time in this lesson, when he says, repent or you shall perish. Repent and, and repent, right? Repent. That means it's a one-time thing. I do it and I'm done. Is that what that says? This is, yes, this is. That's what it sounds like, right? If I say to you, repent or you'll perish. It's a one-time action, but it's not. In Jesus' language, in the language that he used, it's a, the, the case of the language is a, I've just lost the word. It's a present tense verb. That means it's a continual action that starts now and continues forever and ever and ever. So the better translation is always be repenting or you shall perish. And here's your interesting fact for today. Next week, we'll hear the word perish again. Only you won't hear perish. Because next week, we're going to read Luke chapter 15. And Luke chapter 15 is the story of the prodigal son, as you know it. But next week, we'll learn the real title of the story. Um, And the word in there for perish is a, a man lost a sheep and a woman lost a coin. And a son that went away was lost. So be repenting always or you will be lost. It doesn't say that you're going to die. It says you're going to be lost. Right? There's the one thing you need to learn this morning. Because we sin or because somebody sins, that doesn't cause people to die. Causes our relationships with God and others to be lost. And repenting is an action thing. It's an always continual thing that has to happen all the time. We repented this morning, right? We had confession and forgiveness. Does that mean that we haven't sinned between now and then? No, we have. Trust me. We probably, every last one of us have. And we need to be repenting again. Because it's a continual action. And the thing of it is, is repentance is not... I'm sorry, God, I did wrong and I can do better, so I'll do better the next time. Is that what repentance is? I'm sorry I messed up, God, but I know I can do better, so I'll do better next time. That's not repentance. Repentance is, God, I really screwed this up, or I did wrong, and I can't do any better. I can't do it by myself. But if you will come and help me, if you will come and get to the root of the problem, if you will come as the gardener and prune me and and take me back to the place that I need to be, then maybe you can do it through me. But I can't do it on my own. Repentance is understanding that it's not about us. The one quote that I read this past week is, Repentance is us as Christians living a life where we may be wrong. How hard is it for us to admit that we're wrong? And that's what God wants us to do. To live a life knowing that we can't do it on our own. That we can be wrong if we try to do it our way. But God's way is the only way to do it. It's about repentance, not about what's fair. Because if it's what's fair, we all get that. But thanks be to God, we don't. And here's why, how we really know that it's about repentance. That last little parable there about that fig tree. The few things you need to know about fig trees is three years they had to sit fruitless. It says that in Leviticus 19 chapter 23 or 19 verse 23, I think 26, 20, it's 20 something. You'll find it if you go to Leviticus chapter 19. It talks about fruit trees when you plant them. They have to remain bare or any fruit that's grown on them for three years you cannot use. So now when this gardener has come to this tree, it's been, this tree has been growing now for six years and it's been without fruit. And fig trees are notorious at sucking up the nutrients from every other tree. They're nutrient, if you didn't know that, they're nutrient hogs. So for this gardener to spread manure on it is something that no gardener would ever do. But the gardener says, let the tree go for another year and I'll take care of it. And if it doesn't still give fruit, then you can cut it down. One more year. Give me one more year. It's all about that time. Jesus came to give us time to live, to put our lives in order and to make sure that we're turning around to face God, that we're being that person that's 
following after God even when it's hard, even when we can't, and living our lives in a way that shows God's love to everybody because it's about following Him and not our own desires. But the tree did nothing. That's the interesting thing, too. Its sin was not bearing apples because it's a fig tree or not bearing bad fruit. It did nothing. It should have been following after what it needs to be doing and creating fruit. But I leave you with a poem. Some of you have already seen this. It's from a Japanese man, who I'm not going to butcher his name. But it's all about the tree and waiting and following God. The poem is, I read in a book that a man called Christ went about doing good. It is very disconcerting to me that I am so easily satisfied with just going about.